准备要开始了。那再提醒大家一次，因为待会的 session 可能会有呃英文的部分。那如果有需要即时口译的话，可以参考我们大昨天大会寄发的行前通知，里面有我们的 WebEx 的口译连接。那请按照信件内容操作，就可以听到华语和英文的口译。那也请记得戴耳机，然后。用我们的 slide do 来去做提问。那我们 slide do 的连接会在我们现场的大会所提供的共笔的文件里面。那大家有需要的话，都可以用里面的 slide do 连接来去做提问。那在这边再宣传一次我们的 unconf。那我们的 unconf 是由我们现场会众提案。那如果你有自己的 idea 想要发表或想要找人一起来讨论的话，那就来报名吧。那如果你想要听其他人分享他们的 idea， 那就投票给他们，在 u n c o u n t 的时段过去直接参加。那这些贴纸和提案单都在你们的小猫袋里面。那如果他不幸呃不小心遗失的话，那就可以直接到我们的报道师报道处来去拿。那我们线上会众也可以参与，有兴趣呃线上参与讨论或提案的话，到我们 Hack MD 的大会共笔目录找开放工作坊 u n c o n f e r e n c e 进去就会看到我们的现场参与办法了。那以下的呃，我们的这个 session 准备开始。那 Isabel。Hi, can you see us? Hello, hi Paul and Liz. Welcome to join us from. Um, London and New York. Yes. Okay. I will introduce myself and then let Liz and Paul to introduce themselves, and then we'll start a presentation of 20 minutes. And I will ask you to uh, ask you a question in the Slido. Okay. So yeah, I'm Isabel. Uh, um, I'm the chair of um, uh, Joseon Task Force in Gabdiro. Uh, community. I'm also a lawyer, and I have three sons. One is here. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, Liz, it's your turn. Okay. Can you introduce yourself to us? Great. Hi. Um, <clears throat> let me share these slides. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Liz Barry. Um, thank you so much for having us today. I'm a landscape architect and an urban designer who has presented at GovZero many times before on open science for Public Lab, for TreeKit. And I have over a decade of experience with recursive publics and reimagining the human environment relationship. I also want to mention that I'm a founding board member of the Computational Democracy Project, which just launched a couple hours ago here at GovZero Summit um, to steward the Polis code base. And over to you, Paul. Thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'm Paul Fisselthwaite. I live in St Albans, just north of London in the UK. I'm a professional facilitator uh, of collective decision-making processes, I think I, I would describe it as. Um, about seven or eight years ago, I developed a discussion platform, community discussion platform called Thinking Box. And uh, for the last two years, I've been helping out with the democracy side of Extinction Rebellion. Great. Um, so our panel's driving question or our guiding question, as well as what we hope will be a discussion starter with you here in the audience, is how might we grow cultures of facilitation? So as you know, V Taiwan successes have inspired many around the world to bring these practices into broader awareness, especially in the West, um, and to exchange best practices for how to localize a V-Taiwan process to our own cities, counties, countries. And so I'm using the term V-Network to refer to a whole bunch of people who met each other on the GovZero Slack international channel in 2017 and 2018. Um, who live in New York, Toronto, and other locations 
that we're hoping to do something like what you've achieved in Taiwan. And so some of the people involved were CS, Pat Khan, Darshana, Narayanan, Alex Young. And we started teaching about vTaiwan's process and success, and we started training people on the focused conversation method, but we made it a little bit more fun. Instead of O-R-I-D, we used facts, feelings, ideas, and decisions. And then the New York City node worked to bring over members of PEDIS and actual participation officers so that they could lead in English for the first time their extraordinary training content that they run to develop the participation officers program. And so we did that in summer 2018 with Audrey Tang, Avros, Xu Yang, and Fang. <clears throat> and participation officers were Tiffany and Patricia. And I just wanna run through a couple Photos with Denora from GovLab, Devin Balkind, a political candidate, Christina Shi, the designer, Joe Karaganis, Cordelia Yu, um, and here's Audrey demonstrating how to facilitate, and um, Matt Stempeck and Christian Kane Scolding, who's a documentary filmmaker, also shown here. Um, even lunch was fun. We made hot pot, thanks to Tina Ye, um, and we even made the group decision about what to eat together, something fun. So I wanna talk about some of the outcomes that happened from that incredible exchange. And first of all, the same training team from Taiwan led another training in Toronto just a few months later in November. But in New York City that summer, people got right down to business. So we're looking at a picture of Nathan Story, who's a civil servant in the New York City Department of Homeless Services. And his job had a mandate to conduct an evaluation of the department's policy, design, and implementation. And after the V Taiwan and participation officer training, he used the mandate with permission to create a 360 degree consultative policy co-creation process that involved everyone from the top commissioner to the very frontline service delivery staff. And you can look up this case on Participedia, it's in the hackpad. And what was the outcome? It was determined by consensus positions identified in the polis. Um, as well as by specific design responses um, to concerns that were brought up in the interpretive focus groups where there were conflicting perspectives or positions. And so this project has changed the way services were delivered um, by New York City government to street homeless populations. And Nathan Story and team are excited to expand this to include more direct client participation. Now I'd like to introduce you to Hannah Cates. She works at the New York City Open Planning Lab. And she was excited to identify opportunities for public participation in the city charter. So she wrote a script to identify all of the places that are mandated, um, like public review, public hearing, vote, and public participation. And then Nathan took those results and made a map of where in city government we could look and find who is running these processes and reach out to them to invite them into future trainings. <clears throat> now, it's only been a couple months in from, from June to September 2018, but a very large process started. I, I just mentioned the charter, charter mandated participation. Well, once every 25 years or so, the en entire charter of the city of New York, the kind of document that says there will be a mayor or there will be departments and they will govern city planning, they will govern transportation, like the, the founding document of our home rule 
started a revision process. And so much of the civic tech community in New York City, I think some of you know Beta NYC, um, but also members of V Network and fans of GovZero in New York went and testified, <clears throat> sometimes staying late. I went in on September 26th and I left that hearing on September 27th. Um, some things have been won, but not everything yet. And so I wanna, I wanna introduce a big new player on the scene to the municipalist movement. Um, in late 2018, there was a new movement appeared on the world stage to escalate the demand for democracy. Here in New York, it had its first day of action on January 26, 2019 a die-in and banner hang in the middle of Rockefeller Plaza in Manhattan, a very famous place in New York City. <clears throat> and just um, a month and a half later, we erected a seawall around City Hall at the Brooklyn Bridge and had a die-in there. And then a month after that, we hauled a boat into the middle of Times Square and shut it down. <clears throat> now, Paul is going to tell you more about what's driving all of this, but what I saw in Extinction Rebellion was an incredible opportunity, so many different roles that facilitators can play both within a movement and facing outward at the population and at the government. So I'm just showing you a little bit about how Extinction Rebellion is set up in the simplest way. Work is parsed out by domains, like types of work is clustered together. And then um, coordinators of each of those types of work are sent to a coordinator circle in the middle. Now, I just used the word middle, and I'm very well aware of how incredible GovZero is, non-hierarchical and self-organizing. And so I just wanna ask you, hang on just a second while I mention um, why, how this is a way that this has been working. Um, we found that this system really created an antidote to dominating personalities and to hero, to heroic archetypes. <clears throat> um, just to ask for a moment the question, what is governance? and say we're talking about who decides, by what process they will decide, and how people will learn or assess if their decisions were any good or not, and change um, and iterate and govern better um, next time. And facilitators support this process. They support the membership of the working groups by helping to create and define roles and say what criteria would be critical for success. They help the team, they help the members do that. They also help the members nominate people into roles and set terms when it's time to run another nomination. And for these decisions, the facilitators support consent-based decision-making. So that is becoming aware of what's your personal preference What's your acceptable range of tolerance and what by standard of causing harm must you object to? And this makes it much faster to reach. So this is consent based and not consensus. Um, at least in my experience in the West, um, in North America, people or let's just say the United States, we still run into issues with personality conflicts. So I wanna share just a bit of a mashup of a conflict resilience cycle that goes from the green zone of what your basic culture is to the yellow zone of how you can train yourself and prepare yourself to better support processes and situations so that in the pink zone, a large number of people can help intervene if anything goes wrong. And then in the blue zone, there's a process for reflecting what happened and making patches to the culture, hopefully to get everyone back in the green zone. This is part of a larger body of work 
with a crisis convening group um, that I'd be happy to tell you more about a little bit later. <clears throat> so what's all this structure for? Um, once we had a self-organizing system and a conflict resilience system, the political team got down to work and um, based on other Extinction Rebellion work, we wrote a book to make the case for a citizens assembly in New York City. <clears throat> and I wanna um, call out Isadora, April, Archie, Theo, Bug, and Bob um, who ran this team and explain that at this time, once I had done a fair amount of teaching, I moved into a strategic role to help move the entire chapter to focusing on people power. And this lined, this was by May of this past year. That meant that our chapter was really well aligned with this summer movement of black lives and the trajectory now felt by hundreds of thousands of people towards greater accountability of governmental institutions and demanding democratic upgrades, which would only a couple hundred people were demanding in New York before, now thousands and tens of thousands of people are demanding those after this past year. And in this time, I also served as an advisor to Extinction Rebellion's Future Democracy Hub, and I met my co-panelist, Paul. <clears throat> so um, I just wanna say this is what was inspiring us. People deliberating among themselves um, radically lifting the lid on how fast our politics and our political stances towards climate change um, could be transformed. And while that's a long term, that's a, that's a, we're trying to get that as fast as possible, but we've still set intermediate goals and we're already seeing some of the impact of our advocacy for assemblies in the shape of the local campaign. And this will be my last slide, then over to Paul. So obviously this past month, the United States political election caused a lot of news all around the world. Something that won't cause a lot of news, but to those of you who care about municipalism, you may be interested to find out that New York City this coming June is going to essentially flip two thirds of our entire government. 66% of citywide offices will turn over from term limits. That's the mayor and the comptroller. Um, almost 70% of the city council will be new city council people. And four out of five of the counties within New York City will get new presidents. And I just wanna point out one campaign, the Maya for Mayor campaign who's actually organizing her campaign around a series of people's assemblies. Um, and Extinction Rebellion is in dialogue with her campaign as well as there's many other movements. Um, so I'm gonna stop here and excitedly hand it over to Paul for a deeper slice into what Extinction Rebellion is all about. Thank you. Thanks, Liz, and yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just share a little bit about what's happening with Extinction Rebellion and democracy, and it'll be really great to to share that with you, but also to hear any questions and and any advice as well, because you know, we're very much doing the same things, I think. So Extinction Rebellion or XR are there to cultivate transformation and addressing the climate and ecological emergency. And we have three demands. It's slightly different in different parts of the world because we're international. But in the UK, we've got three demands to firstly get the government to tell the truth, um, to aim to get to net zero carbon by 2025, and to set up and be uh, led by the um, results of a citizens' assembly on the climate and ecological emergency. And the main theory of change originally, and uh, still continues to be the case, is of non-violent direct action. And uh, you've seen from Liz a few examples of the kind of things that uh, have been happening in terms of disruption uh, to draw attention and promote the, the importance of addressing this one more urgently. Um, XR launched in October 2018. And in the UK, we did our first national action on in November on the five bridges. You can see the first image at the top there. 
Uh, you can see the London Eye in the background. That's one of the bridges in London. And, and then the first international rebellion was in April 2019. And this really hit the headlines, especially in the UK. So mainstream press, front page of the news, uh, first item on the, on the BBC News each day. And so really did have quite a big impact. And we've had further international rebellions in October 2019 and September of this year. Um, next slide, please. And in just honing in on democracy in XR, our third demand, as I've already mentioned, is to uh, set up and be led by uh, the results of a citizen's assembly. Uh, but that's the literal translation. What that really kind of stands for is a transformation of democracy within the culture. And as Liz has been describing, the decentralized structure within XR um, is embedding a lot of democratic processes within that, particularly making use of people's assemblies. And you can see an example of that one in the image there that was taken place in October 2019 in Trafalgar Square, the center of London, where we had about a thousand people um, in defiance of a, a citywide ban of any two people coming together to protest. And that resulted in that law being over, that um, ruling being overturned in the law courts uh, a few days later. Um, and what happened when people found out about XR and saw that third demand, all the people who were involved with democracy started coming to us and approaching us and said, we love what you're doing, can we help? And so that's where um, we developed the Future Democracy Hub, which was a, a gathering of some of the people who have been involved in democracy for many years. And that ultimately led to us developing a program called Trust the People, which I'll, I'll share a bit more about here in a moment. Next slide, please. So this is some of the very the basics, which I'm sure you'll all know about what we're trying to put over in the XR about what's needed in the culture. And we're asserting that the DNA of our outdated democratic system is actually within all of us. And we need to develop and cultivate a new democratic uh, system, culture and tools to go with it. Uh, next slide, please. And what's particularly um, relevant about this is that in times of crisis, people in that system, the existing system, tend to look towards authority. And what we're um, trying to facilitate is that instead of doing that, we're looking to ourselves and all of these deliberative processes where people come together and discuss and find out what the different perspectives are and come to a wise decision are uh, trying to do that. Next slide, Liz. I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with these quotes. Um, they're quite well known. Uh, the first one, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's from Buckminster Fuller. Uh, so that's one of the, the foundations, I think, that we're working towards. The other one, uh, the famous quote from Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking we used when we created them. So that is indicating why the dual approach of yes bringing tools in and bringing new approaches but also that needs to be built on a on a culture that uh, basically is at the heart of relatedness within human beings next slide please liz and if we're trying to transform the the dna of the democratic culture it's really important that we address this at many many different levels so you'll 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 have understood hopefully that the third demand is looking for um, a transformation of decision making at the national level so the very national highest level of governments um, but not only that we're looking to facilitate a transformation within the entire culture and i don't think any of us really know exactly where um, the ripple effect will be the be the greatest so what we're doing is we're we're saying to everybody who's involved with XR who's interested in transforming democracy to address this problem wherever they can in the culture. So in organizations, in local councils, community groups, teams, clubs and societies, even your friends and family. Because um, then and only then will the DNA start to change and we'll start to expect a, a higher level of, of democratic decision making in the culture. Next slide, please. So just going back to what I hinted at earlier is that we 
believe, or I certainly believe there's two fundamentals. Yes, you need good democratic processes, upgraded tools, the very best of what we've got available on the planet right now. Um, but the, only use those on top of building great relationships, cultivating empathy, and this sense of community, even within a, a deliberative session, uh, rather than just launching and saying, okay, here's the facts, here's your chance to discuss it, and here's the opportunity to integrate all of those views into a final position. Let's really connect and relate as human beings rather rather than the current adversarial approach, which often polarizes people to the point at which they can't really see um, the, the, the views of anybody else. And the approach that we're taking is that all of that requires good facilitators. So the question then became, how can we cultivate a, a culture and an army of facilitators to, to address this challenge? Uh, next slide, please. So that's where we came up with the idea of a program called Trust the People. And this is devised to create um, a network of uh, democracy facilitators with the kind of skills and capabilities that I was describing uh, was, was required. And the format that we came up with, which seems to have worked quite well, is a six-week course which um, runs for six weeks and then pauses and then we start another one so people can join whichever cohort uh, they want to. Um, and within that, we have five modules. And I will just go through what these modules are so you'll get a sense of what's kind of making up that particular approach. Uh, the first one is understanding ourselves so that we can actually become more conscious of, about some of the things that we need to work on ourselves. Um, unconscious biases, anything that would raise the consciousness of our own individual selves. Um, and with an awareness of that, you can then start to think about the second aspect, which is being able to support a team, a collective of people, either in a session or in, in a, an ongoing group of, or team that's trying to work on this in your local community. The next stage is teaching and supporting people in reaching out with those skills to their local communities. And this is, in our experience, is one of the, the fundamental steps which takes the, um, the largest amount of time because it's not just a matter of saying, right, we'd like to have a gathering, everybody come round. If you do that, you'll tend to just get the usual suspects and you're not penetrating into the, the culture to get the diversity and representation that really is essential to get a good wise answer from any collective. So this is where the work is in terms of deep hanging out, connecting with the, the cultures and the parts of the environment and the, and the community that you're not regularly in contact with and bringing people with very diverse perspectives and experiences together into one place. Um, if you can do that, then the, the process then needs to be something about how do you actually run a session to make a decision. So we teach them people about community assemblies, uh, one way of bringing people together and making collective decisions. And then, of course, once they've made a decision, um, they'll want to do something about it to implement that. And that might not necessarily be done at the official level. So people can then organize themselves to make those changes in the community that will deliver ultimate results. Uh, just a little bit about the format. It's a very simple two-hour workshop each week. Um, as, as the minimum and then we run additional workshops and what's been great is that we've had good numbers, um, 60 to 100 people in each workshop and um, a lot of them are coming for the additional ones as well so that seemed to work quite well. And the, the next challenge is to how do we support that growing movement of community transformers. So we've got two approaches, the one that's been going for a while is that we allocate people to a group of people, about nine people, called a hive, and they can work together on supporting each other in their own community work. And the, the new initiative is to do a regular open space gathering where the entire community can come together and, and share ideas on a regular basis. Uh, but it remains to see how, how that's still a, a work in, in progress and finding out what, what would actually work best for this, uh, this growing community. And next slide, please, Liz. 
And we're just going to finish on just some examples, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. So they're, they're, they're just a, a snapshot of the kind of things that is actually happening. So different types of approaches of decision making, uh, people's assemblies are very common. We're also promoting participatory budgeting as, as an entry level approach at local level. Uh, we have quite a big independent um, uh, representative uh, uh, um, what's the word movement in in the UK called Flatback Democracy, and there's some examples where rather than uh, candidates running for council for local council are affiliated with political parties, they're completely independent and are there only to serve the the, the, the needs of the residents. Uh, there's some local lev level initiatives that uh, you can see written there. Transition towns is is quite well known internationally, and climate emergency centres. Um, we support a, a range of processes that facilitators might use in terms of making their decisions and facilitating that process in their communities. There's some convergent facilitation and dynamic facilitation uh, listed there. And um, the other thing is that's happening is a, um, an element of movement of movement. So the collaboration of democracy uh, organizations coming together and sharing and and learning from each other and then the final one there is that just going full circle back to the the third demand which i mentioned at the very beginning to have a national citizens assembly um there's a climate and ecological emergency bill going through uk parliament which can be supported by the existing system and that's it for me i uh, hope that's given you a slice of, the, of what we're doing in xr uh, regarding democracy and um, back to Isabel for any any questions. Yes, thank you Paul and Liz. That's very inspiring and um, I will use the um, privilege as a moderator to ask you two questions first. Uh, the first question is, uh, can you describe more about the decentralized uh, structure in your community and also um, what tools or um, events do you use uh, to maintain the momentum and the connection within the community when it is decentralized? So can uh, Liz answer the question first? Did you hear me? No? Not so well. Uh -oh. Not clear, no. Okay, maybe. Okay, can you hear me now? Not yep. really. Yes. Okay. Um, I I will ask you to uh, describe the um, uh, decentralized st structure of the your community, and also uh, what kind of tools do you use to maintain the momentum uh, of the members within the community. Great. Um Maybe I can give a shot at that. Um, yeah. yeah, for the decentralized structure, we, we try to help people find where they can make a personally meaningful and unique contribution mm -hmm. in the kind of working groups that have been set up to handle the work that needs to be done of producing uh, a rebellion in order to move power to the people. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an in-depth onboarding process where we listen to the interests of the people coming in and also give them introductory content, help them find their place. Then there's additional, additional kind of experiences so that they can understand how decisions get made. People tend to be pretty pleased with that and communications are very active. Um, one thing I'll bring up as um, kind of a two sides to the coin, we can't have one without the other, which is within the self-organizing system because you hear us talking about structure a lot and the meetings can feel quite procedural sometimes mm -hmm. in order to hear hear everyone's voices in rounds and make brief decisions on clear proposals. Um, it means that 
people in a chapter of XR tend to have to spend time with each other outside of working group meetings, building relationships, building empathy, growing what XR calls um, a regenerative culture, because that's what really holds us together when the stress comes and when the you know, stress either from deciding how to get this rebellion accomplished or stress from confronting massive power systems. Paul, does that give you any ideas of anything to add? Yeah, no, I think you described that quite well. And um, it, it, is a, it is a challenge. We've got this decentralized uh, system where as long as you follow the principles and values of the, the whole organization, then you are able to take uh, mm -hmm. actions under the under the banner of the movement, mm -hmm. um, but you know it's not without its challenges. And um, well, one of the things that we've been working with uh, just recently is a kind of a citizens' assembly approach. So we're developing our new strategy for 2021 at the moment, and instead of that being done centrally, uh, we've gathered a representative group as far as we can at the moment, it's not perfect by a long way, but it's a step in the right direction of the movement and they will make the decisions about what the strategy becomes so that the different regions, certainly within the UK, feel that they're having a say and they're being represented in that, in that process. So hopefully that will uh, be a step in the right direction as well. Okay, thank you. Then we will go to the Slido uh, and this is a question on the Slido, um, we will project some Slido's question on, on the screen. So uh, Liz and um, Paul, can you see the Slido? Uh, yes, I can see it. Yes, okay. Maybe we'll confirm the first question. Uh, not everyone in Taiwan knows the concept of a recur recursive public. Can you elaborate the concept with um, uh, with the story you gave us? Sure, I can do that. And um, I have heard people in GovZero also refer to this term recursive public, which was written by Chris Kelty probably almost 20 years ago now. And it makes connections to the political philosopher Habermas, who articulated how a public sphere can be maintained. And by when Chris Kelty wrote um, Recursive Public, he was speaking to internet communities who in a very self-aware manner are building their own means of producing the kind of public that they want to be. And they're iterating on their own self-creation infrastructure so that they can enable new possibilities for the way that they can be a public together. Um, and uh, large open source communities may be familiar with, um, you know, norm evolving norms for moderation, um, channel structures in your Slack, um, the, the kind of onboarding sequences. Um, all of these are infrastructures that communities build for themselves because that's the way they want to be together. And um, it's this kind of um, self-creating community that, um, that I'm invoking when I use Chris Kelty's term, recursive public. Okay. So um, the next question is, uh, I, I'm interested in the last step of what is governance in this portion of the panel. Uh, feedback, learn, and recovery. An example would be really lovely. Can you give us some example? Okay, great. Um, let me just check which slide that may have been. Was it the, um, and let me just share this. Uh, so now I think you're just seeing my, um, my presenter view here. Um, is it this slide or is it this one? Who asked this question? Okay, I, I think it's this one. The, this one. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, this definition actually comes from a group, Sociocracy for All. 
So luckily, there's um, on this specific content, there's a lot for you to look up. They have a book called Many Voices, One Song. And yes, they did all record themselves singing parts of a song. But never mind about that. Um, this, this is actually, to me, it's the most succinct definition of what is governance I've ever seen. And I've become interested in this even beyond its direct application in Extinction Rebellion. I, they separated out the, the structure of who decides from the process by which they make a decision and the way that this structured body can come to learn outputs can come to get, you know, evaluations, measurements, feedback. How do you know if your decision was any good or not? And as I'm from the open sciences, I find the concept of how does information enter into governance processes fascinating because that's essentially what we're facing with climate change. And this is a bit of a riff and not an exact example, but I'm hoping it will suffice. Um, if, there, if the proper information about pollution sources, where the fossil fuel was taken out of the ground and who was getting sick next door, right on the fence line of those factories, refineries, pipelines, oil wells, if our government could have become aware of that information and acted on it, perhaps the problem wouldn't have grown to the climate and ecological emergency. So how you get information into government, how, how um, a group of how people in the process itself is able to learn um, is, is the problem and is the meta problem at the same time. Is that enough of an example? Yeah, I think so. So um, maybe, um, so can you describe what, what, what is the governance within, within the extinction rebellion? Do you have any written uh, documents for this governance thing in your community? Because actually as a um, decentralized uh, community or polycentric community of uh, God, God Zero, we have a lot of uh, documents of, about uh, governance in the community. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again, Isabel? Okay, um, maybe, can you describe what kind of governance um, within the, um, is within the, um, your community? Are you saying documents or governance? Uh, governance. Governance. Governance, right. Yes. Do you want to take a stab at it, Paul? Right, yes. Um, so the the basic structure I described uh, was decentralized. So um, the as long as anybody can take uh, action on behalf of the movement, providing they abide by the, the, the values and the uh, the principles, and there was there were ten of those, um, and excuse obviously me, excuse we, me, we're all working to get the third three demands. Yeah. Do you want to clarify something uh, as well? Yes. Uh, do you have any um, documents about the principles? The doc documentations uh, about the principles that you use for the members of the community. Uh, can I just check? You're you're asking for a list of the principles and values. Uh, yes, the principle. But do they do do you uh, document it? The principles written in written yes. words. Yeah. Yes, they're, they're documented. Yes, so they're available um, publicly on on all of the websites. The oh, XR okay. Hold. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, so that and they they they're working. I mean, I've got them up in front of me here. So actively mitigating for power. We're a non-violent network. Uh, we use the regenerative culture, so there's there's lots of them in there. Uh, but just going back to your question of governance, um, this is something that's absolutely evolving within XR and has been worked on from the very beginning, as you would imagine. So uh, everybody, just going back to the stuff that I was mentioning in the presentation, 
we're all people that are living in this culture that we already, you know, are, are in, in kind of immersed in. And that's very hierarchical. So we're probably all coming from companies that are working on hierarchical measures. So it's not just a matter of going from that and suddenly coming into a decentralized structure and understanding how it works. So it's very much about working, um, you know, trying to find ways of, of, of making that work. And it takes time, but those principles are kind of um, permeating and gradually and at an increasing rate. But I'll just go give you an example of where it shows up. Um, there's a lot of different opinion potentially on, on any particular issue. And if you're talking about what we're doing in terms of nonviolent direct action, which is putting yourself in a vulnerable, arrestable position to demonstrate your commitment and to raise the awareness of the urgency of the, the climate crisis. Um, there is always a, a difference of opinion often seen um, as to how risky you should be and how controversial and disruptive you should be. And so that's been one of the very immediate challenges uh, to be able to manage. Um, and then there's, there's all the other aspects of of making collective decisions. And I described one earlier about how we're trying to, to do that now regarding a representative group of people making a decision on behalf of the movement. Do you want to say something about this question? Oh, yes. Do you oh, want to add uh, something? No, I no? think I think that's plenty. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then we go back to the Slido. Okay, here's the question. How diverse is Extinction Rebellion? Could you give a personal snapshot of it? Perhaps it is the one you are contributing the most. Do you want me to have a go at that, Liz? Yep, and then I'll go. Okay. Um, well, this is a, a famous criticism of XR that uh, we are predominantly white, uh, middle class, and oh. uh, there's there's some uh, truth in that um, because the very nature of what we're putting ourselves forward and people are interested in the the climate crisis and have the the privilege of being able to give up their time to come along and do the kind of things that we're saying and also there's a there's an inherent um bias in terms of who might be able to consider themselves arrestable in a disruption and um the 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 consequences of arrest for different parts of the population are very different so that's something that um, XR had to take on uh, and learn an enormous amount in the first two years of their their existence, and and that is is beginning to change. I can see that, um, and it, it's 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 more about representing the, the 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 and embodying the principles of everybody having a say, which is kind of in the DNA of the three demands. So that third demand is saying rather than the privileged people in our cultures making the decisions on behalf of everybody, we have everybody included. And that takes time and effort to get right. It's not just to say, here's the template, here's the formula, let's just get it done. It takes time to, to transform and uh, we're very committed to doing that. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I would add that um, as Paul was just describing that the all of this energy of XR is to bring about uh, a citizens assembly that looks like the entire society. And so for New York City, there may be a lot of white people doing a bunch of stuff, but the assembly that we're demanding will be 70% people of color. Um, there will be 11% differently abled, the, the median income will be below 60,000 US dollars um, annual income. And this would be so radical, so far beyond simply getting testimony from frontline people, but literally moving 
um, the actual people in of the city into the decision making process. Um, I have had in my collaborations. I, I just told shared a few anecdotes from my last few years of work in upgrades to democracy. What led you know Gov Zero collaborations, XR collaborations. I have collaborated with all sorts of people, and um, what I what I'm what I'm interested in is there may be a work team, but what are they working for? <clears throat> and that's to move power out to um, the, the entire rest of society. So sometimes that's how I think about it. Then the next question, who are the facilitators in your stories? Um, what brought them in motivated and motivated them? The, the, so I'll, I'll have a go at that one first. Um, the facilitators uh, that we've been working with mostly in the Trust the People program are from uh, the movement, the, the rebel network that we've got. And what's been really encouraging is the number of people that have been coming forward. And, and remember, this is slightly different um, to the, the, the main um, approach of XR to do nonviolent direct action. This is very much uh, rather about disrupting and raising awareness in the, of, the, of the failings of the current system. It's, it's more channeling that energy not only into that but also into creating the stuff that we're asking for and supporting the process of, of building that new system. Um, and so, but essentially, they are some of them are already experienced facilitators. Um, many people who work in, in XR have, have a background in, in organizing and running groups. And, and they're people who, uh, a lot of them are people who just, just care about what needs to be done and are then taking on the, the challenge of becoming uh, skilled in an area which they're not currently skilled in, which has also been really. Uh, really, really great to see. So, and and within that community, the the sharing of the the expertise and some people with lots of experience, some people without, uh, very much working together uh, on the same um, intent. I'd love a go at this yeah. question too. This is such a wonderful question, and I just want to give so much credit to the Gov Zero community. For, and, and for the spin-off community of V Taiwan, which has its own community, um, to really center the role of the facilitator, the role, the augmented human who is the one seeing across perspectives and processing information and helping people actually be in the same conversation with each other. And to open up, so I just want to thank Gov Zero. Um, and maybe even the, the, the generation of the parents of Gov Zero and the democracy work that has been started and carried for generations. Anyways, anyways, I really like you guys. And what I'm trying to say in the United States, the polarization is exhausting and it's driving participation downward. Now, maybe not in our last election. I mean, wow. Okay, but uh, people are scared of, scared of, but also hungry to actually meet these people who seem to be caricatured as monsters and who the way we live our lives are either completely separated in bubbles or are so close within our families that there are family fractures that will last decades and generations. And there is, there is paralysis and fear, but also so much desire and just the sense that it's within our grasp. If we can be with each other differently, maybe um, um, put down our, our polarization and find the surprising things that we have in common, um, that at a very little level, we can work to um, toss those polarizing parties and forces out the window. Um, and then maybe at a medium level, prof people with professional training, um, maybe they're lawyers or maybe they're social workers or maybe 
maybe they're people who wouldn't otherwise be frontline activists. Now, in, in, a, in a worldview like this, we can see that those people who can see across domains and across perspectives and who can help people be in the same conversation, all of a sudden it puts them in a central political role in a politics that's not about battle argumentation. And I think that's very exciting for people. So basically, where do the facilitators come from? We're trying to open up new pathways to different walks of life to realize that there's a role that their democracy needs them to fill. And I'll stop there. Ooh, it's well say. Yeah, really touching. And um, um, yeah, I think the facilitators in Gov Zero or in XR are trying to um, provide the space to people from different backgrounds to feel included. So they can co-work together and trying to find solve the problems in our era, yeah. And um, the next question in the Slido, okay. Uh, okay, someone loves the onboarding system. Are there any downside of having one? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but the, the onboarding system, I think you may be referring to the Trust the People program and how we get people to take part in that. So um, th that what's been really great about we, we we decided to change the format of that because we were running regular weekly workshops and the numbers were going down. So there's something not working about that. And then this idea of having a, a six-week program uh, which people can keep coming back to, uh, really seem to to hit the mark. So it's been it's been great that more people have come along for that for a more consistent approach to uh, learning some of the the basics. And because it was very much building um, in stages, it presumably felt a lot more comprehensive. Um, but th this is an ongoing challenge as well. And what we've got to do now is to try and support people. And now they've graduated from that program to do the real the real work and that's the bit which probably is the unknown area how do we go from having people come along to a course which they get looked after to going out and then looking after other people and putting yourself out there as a facilitator not an easy step Paul, I'm wondering if you could share, there's a really beautiful document, the purple one, that I wonder if you would consider sharing. Is that with, with the, yeah, the, tr the, the Trust of People program? Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah, how, how would I share that? Um, uh, just, if you put it in this chat, I'll put it in the hackpad. Okay, it's a, lot, it's a while since I've got it, but I'll, I'll look for it. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll share it. It's really yeah, beautiful. I love Paul. the trust the um, trust the people program. Maybe we can set up an online meeting for this, and we will invite this and um, Paul to share with us more detailed. Okay, is this possible? Great. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Great, thanks, okay. Isabel. Yeah. Then okay. Then I will move uh, move to the next question, and uh, we can contact for for the detail for the online meeting later. So how, to, how, how do you help people to access information communities? Um, uh, no, information communicate about climate change. Um, I, I'm going to give a, a, a non answer uh, with apologies is that um, my work my work is on actual sites of pollution where the carbon gets pulled out of the ground. And um, in the United States, in, these are environmental justice issues and they are still going on even as not tending to them has amassed into a large climate change problem. So I just wanna say, even though I'm in Extinction Rebellion, I, I do not focus on pushing information about climate change. I still focus on old fashioned pollution uh -huh. and facilitation for democracy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, then I think it would be the last question. Are there any works within XR regarding the massive delocalization of pollution that green energy uh, involved, like Chile, China? Yeah, I'll answer that. Um, yeah, I think Liz just hinted at that. Um, that one of the aspects of XR, which is um, we might have personal views on individual policies, but obviously the, the third demand is that the population and a random selection of the population actually do the decision making about wh what they would like to do to solve the climate crisis. And so um, individual policies is is not something that we generally comment on, although we may have individual views. So, um, and, does, and there's one yeah. there's one last little question, Isabel, yes. about the diversity of uh -huh. the citizens' assembly. Mm -hmm. And essentially, this is what I think. This is the beauty of creating a mass movement to pressure the government to upgrade their own processes, which is that the government probably with, you know, an advising group of um, professional facilitators um, would use their own population records, uh, post office records to probably invite uh, many tens, maybe a hundred thousand people randomly through a civic lottery. And then um, as people responded with their availability, by the way, these terms are paid, um, then Another group of people ensures through interviews that the final sample is a uh, representative of the the population. So luckily, XR does not have to do that work. Where this is what we're advocating the government to do in our third demands. I think yeah. I think that's uh, this session, and uh, but. We are going to arrange another online meetup to uh, know more about the Trust the People program. So thank you, Liz and Paul. Thank you. And uh, good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>